Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start now. Okay. Virginia code 2-237082-3 provides that a public body may meet virtually if the locality in which it is located has declared a local state of emergency provided that the catastrophe catastrophic nature of the declared emergency makes it impracticable or unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And two, the purpose of the meeting is to provide for the co continuity of operations of the public body or the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, or responsibilities. Could somebody please call the roll for the commissioners? Chair Henry. Present. Mayor Walker. Present. Commissioner Goldblatt. Commissioner Green. Present. Commissioner Wicks. Commissioner Parker. She was here. Yeah, I just saw her. Commissioner Parker. Yeah. Thank you. Can we please have a moment of silence? Okay, I'm going to read the announcements, meeting dates and reminders. Uh, first of all, CRHA work board session will be Thursday, December 9th at five. CRA board regular meeting will be Monday, December 20th at six. The safety meeting, which is every other Tuesday. The next one coming up will be December 7th and December 21st, and those are at 6 p.m. And there's a passcode um, that you need to get into it. I'm, I'll read it off. It's 181698. And um, I think you can find the link if you go to the webpage. Um, the redevelopment committee meets every other uh, Thursday of the month at 4 p.m. And so the updated times are December 2nd and December 16th. Um, the Resident Services Committee meets every second Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. The Maintenance Committee meets every second Tuesday of the month at 4 p.m. The personnel committee meets quarterly or at present eternally. Um, and the finance committee is to be arranged. Okay. Um, public comments. Or there any, well, I guess I should ask first any other announcements that I didn't mention that anybody else has to make. Public comments? At this time, if you'd like to address the commission, please click your raise hand icon. You have three minutes to speak. Chair, I see no hands. Okay, then we can go on to comments from- Hey, um, I, I had my hand raised, but it's, it's a quiet hand. Well, you, you always get to comment. I was just gonna raise, say your name. Comments from Shelby? Thank you. Good evening, uh, CRHA Board of Commissioners. My name is Shelby Marie Edwards. I use she, her, and hers. I'm the Executive Director of FAR, the Public Housing Association of Residents. We are the duly recognized and federally mandated 
um, housing association. So September, October, and November has been very preoccupied with hiring and onboarding of new FAR staff. Our staff includes Paula Covarrubias, Kelsey Jones, uh, Salithia Carr, Alexis Cooper, Cecilia, Barbara, Erica Gaines, and Ingrid Fagans, who is our volunteer. Um, we are so excited to continue being out and about in the community in a way that is COVID um, safe and friendly. Um, FAR has received multiple complaints lately about maintenance updates. I was pleased to hear and um, Dr. Henry slash Chair Henry's update something about a maintenance committee reconvening. Um, I, if that could either be reiterated one more time before the end of the meeting, I think that would be great. But I love hearing that the um, maintenance committee would potentially reconvene. Um, I also know that Rent Cafe is slated to start in the site sometime early next year. Rent Cafe being that uh, the online model for residents being able to pay a rent. So I would love um, I would love to see CRHA do some type of training with the residents so that they are comfortable with that in, in the new year. Um, and those are my updates. Thank you so much, everybody. And I look forward to um, seeing the rest of the meeting and seeing how things play out. Thanks, y'all. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Henry. <laughs> um, update from commissioners. Um, is there a safety committee update? Rosiah, are you prepared to do that at this point or? Um, I missed this last meeting. I had two meetings that day, so I didn't get to go to the past meeting. But um, the last meetings that we were talking about um, before this one, we was basically um, talking about the uh, exterminations to the um, units. Um, where we, where I had spoke up about when uh, the units get treated, that they need to treat all the units in the row instead of the one unit, because if you treat just that one unit, whatever bugs depends on whatever it is that they are exterminating is going to run back and forth to either neighbors. And a couple of uh, residents had spoke up, you know, about the COVID, but um, I understand that we are in COVID, but if we're prepared we prepare ourselves and they're prepared to come into our units. We need to have that done and not just one unit treated at one time because it's, you know, a lot of units have been being done and a couple of units have been being left out. And some of those units that have been left out are a lot of the ones that are the most infested. And um, we had the uh, outdoor meeting, which kind of got a little chilly, but, you know, it seemed to have been going great. We was talking about the, um, different structures of uh, the uh, apartments and you know what we felt that was needed to be done to them. And uh, one resident had spoke up and uh, Mr. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, oh, I can't think of Mrs. Sales was supposed to have, um, go see her. So I don't wanna say her name because I don't know if we have that permission to do so. But uh, Mr. Sales was supposed to have spoke with her the next day, but I'm not sure if he spoke with her on her apartment or not. Um, and then just basically we was gonna reiterate how to do uh, the safety meetings. Uh, you know, are we gonna do them? You know, how are we gonna progress and continue doing it? Any other commissioners have an update? Okay, um, I'm gonna move then on to the finance director update and the financial report. Ms. Hoffman. Oops, sorry. Hello. Um, I, I know the finance report I sent out today, I'm, I'm sorry, it was a little last minute, but um, it wasn't without a lot of effort. So um, the write-up, uh, if you've had a chance to look at it, uh, as we've kind of reiterated every month, that overall, bottom line, um, the first five pages, I don't know, Kathleen, if you have that and want to share it, it's not totally necessary, but it might help as a point of reference for anyone who doesn't have it in front of them. Um, against budget, we're doing really well, but again, we're 
um, $517,000 ahead of budget at this point, but that includes $644,000 worth of, for all intent and purposes, non-recurring money, 515,000 in shortfall funds. And um, of the total PPP grant of 270, there's 100, approximately 129 included in our financials here. Um, there was another portion of it that went to last fiscal year um, across public housing to help our scores. And there's um, the remainder of it uh, in redevelopment and the city funds, which eventually we will get to on the financial, um, the finance committee. They're not included with the HUD statements though. Um, so it, well, it looks great. It's not as great as it appears. Oh, I was talking about the um, actual statements was the also attached with that. Um, the good news is, I don't want to steal John's thunder. He probably may have shared it in other forums, but the PPP loan was um, fully forgiven. Um, we applied and they turned it around fairly quickly. Um, so just to point to the items that I spoke of, um, in the middle section under grant income, the second line uh, HUD shortfall funds that's at currently at 515,000. The PTD is actually our fiscal year to date actual. Um, and then Kathleen, if you wanna scroll down one page. And uh, because of the way our scoring works, we're pulling expenses out rather than adding the, uh, um, PPP revenue in. So under administrative salaries, you can see um, the second, second line um, where there's a negative of 125. And then the fourth line where there's a negative under um, some insurance items for 4,000. That's the 129 that has been pulled out. And actually it contributes to the other funds that I talked about and zeros out the um, total amount of the PPP loan. Um, Let's see. Um, so we did uh, in October, we did draw $184,000 of shortfall. Um, I'll just, as a preview in November, we withdrew the balance of what is available to us at this time. And John can probably speak to that a little bit um, better than I can as to when and what is available. Um, I will say we are on track with, um, we've had, since I started, there's been, it's been a struggle on any credit accounts. Like um, we have a credit account at Lowe's. There's probably anywhere from, I would say on a low end, maybe 35 to 60 or 70 transactions a month. So to get all of those receipts timely and to get them entered, um, when I started, we had a lot of catching up to do. And this is the first month that it actually, I didn't have to do an entry. Uh, actually, I may have done an entry for it, but we had all the, all the receipts but for one, so we just couldn't post it. Um, and likewise with the credit cards and just some things that were lagging, everything is caught up. The only exception right now is the VRS retirement, which I just um, need to spend a little time on and that will get entered and all up to date um, for November. But the total there, um, that falls to the bottom line on our expense side. I think I've accrued a portion of it, so it may only be in an additional like $8,000. Um, let's see, what else? I, I, we looked at every, um, you have the statements by AMP, but we looked at every individual um, cost center property and they all are performing um, fairly well against the budget, again, some better than others if you were to take out the shortfall funds. Um, I will, one thing um, to point out, just so you're aware of it with Crescent Halls, what's happened is um, in the past, they were getting their proportional share um, based on the number of total units that we have. So when we had 376, they were at 105, can't remember the percentage off the top of my head, somewhere between 25 and 30%. Um, 
now that the number of approved units has gone down, they are getting significantly less, but those costs have to go someplace. So we've reduced the denominator from 376 to I think 326. Um, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but now every other cost center is gonna get a slightly higher proportionate share. Oh, 324, thanks John. Um, because the denominator has been decreased. So if you had 100 before out of 300, you got a third. And if you reduce those number of units to 200, now you're getting half. So obviously it's not that dramatic. Um, it's less significant on the scattered sites because they're such a small percentage to begin with. But it basically is shifting some of the costs that we had budgeted for Crescent Halls to the other um, property. So, and between now and the end of the year, we will see a, an effect from that. Um, on the um, HCV side, um, I continue to kind of shift through or sift through all of the um, different types of vouchers that we're getting money for now. Some have been leased up faster than others. So I don't necessarily have a handle on what might be due back. We're getting closer to knowing that number but they've all been allocated out to their proper cost centers. So we, the HCV um, report that you'd see, it is a roll up of the mainstream vouchers, the tenant protection vouchers, the emergency housing vouchers. Um, uh, there's probably a few more in there that have activity. So we are looking at it and eventually I'll be able to um, pay a little bit more attention to uh, the revenue that we've gotten versus the revenue that we've earned. Um, let's see, what else? On the um, central office, um, the management fee is down. That does, that also plays into the number of units. Typically you get X amount per bed. We're not getting as much anymore. Um, I mentioned the um, small business PPP loan has been forgiven. Um, the net loss for the month, can you go to COC, Kathleen? I think it's like the third, oh, maybe the fourth one. It's after um, HCV. It's, yeah, a few more pages. So one thing, um, when I sent these to John to preliminary <laughs> review, immediately he's like, the COC has a loss, and that's true. Um, if you go to the last, oh, you went too far, I think. One more page. Right here. Oh, if you can get the bottom line on the screen. So here, um, the month to date actuals shows a $12,300 loss um, for the month. And that typically does not happen. I can tell you that's 100% attributed to um, towards the bottom of the admin expenses on this page. There's a $17,567 $17, expense. That was a um, IRS tax penalty that I was previously totally unaware of. Um, it was assessed against CRHA for failing to timely file 1099s for the tax year of 2017. Um, by the end of 2018, they probably would have been notified. Um, it, it, they must have um, submitted them within 30 days because I believe the minimum penalty was assessed, which is $50 per 1099. So it, it's around 340. 350 1099s, it's not only for our vendors, but most of the landlords have to get a rent 1099. Um, so I found out about it by accident. We, our health insurance company had conflicting information related to our tax ID number. And I called the IRS to verify it. And they were actually very helpful. I spoke to a live person. And when we got all done, he goes, you know, you get, you owe us $17,000 and there's a lien coming out in the next week. It just happened to be that timing. So for a short period of time, we did have a little bit of panic 
that there was a lien. Um, basically, if we hadn't paid it by the timeline they had requested, the bank would have taken it out of, out of our account and paid it for us and taken a fee also. So um, they, there, to my knowledge, uh, Michelle gave me a file at some point at the end of 2018 or early 2019, there was a letter written and a request for it to be waived. Um, I, their response was no, <laughs> um, but they had several different mailing addresses for us. So we never got the, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I didn't see at the time, I'm assuming if they had seen it, they would have been aware of it, either accrued for it and or paid for it. Certainly auditors should have accrued for it in the um, 2017, 2018 um, fiscal year. So I, I will bring this up at, at our audit, which is coming up to see how they wanna handle it. But um, that was a little bit of a hit that we took this month. Um, and then the other thing I just wanna point out, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did you confirm that there were no other outstanding? That was the only one? Yes, it was the only one. And we also, I, um, the, the guy um, who was kind of like our case manager on it uh, was actually very helpful. And um, I talked to him about, you know, what other avenues that we could take, given that it was $17,000, you know, what, what were the chances that we would be able to get that waived? And we had missed all the timing deadlines to appeal the initial decision. So he basically said it was slim to none, but if we wanted to hire, hire an attorney and to um, fight it, we could. And we didn't think that that was gonna be a value based on the information that we had and, and the letters that we had received once we finally got it. Um, Mayor, I, <laughs> I will comment that um, shortly after we discovered that, um, the we went to pick up our uh, utility bills from the city. And because one of the addresses that they had was our office in the city, they actually had sent something to the to city hall with a um, return receipt requested. <laughs> like there had to be an acknowledgement. So somebody at city hall actually signed for it. And that was sent like at the end of July or August and we got it um, at uh, in the beginning of October. So <laughs> I guess mail is uh, hard to come by if it doesn't find the right place in city hall. So, um, but we had known, we had known about it by then and we're uh, in the process of resolving it. Um, and then the only other thing that I wanted to point out on COC is, um, Kathleen, if you can scroll up one page. <clears throat> Oh, right there, administrative. And the administrative, oh, sorry, I actually don't think it's on this page. I'm sorry, it's on the next page. Um, down under general expenses, it's actually the last line on here. Um, I've added and tried to capture from June going forward and I'm gonna go back and reconcile at least to the beginning of the fiscal year. When I started, you know, we pay pretty hefty insurance bills for, um, I think it's three or four retirees. Um, one of the retirees uh, is also insuring their spouse and they reimburse us for it. And there's small co-pays on that. And um, it adds up and, and it always kind of just got lumped in with our administrative uh, employee expenses in the COC cost center. And you can see now that this is only five months worth of expense and the year to date we're at $10,000. So it does run, um, I may have captured a little bit um, in the early months, but it's, I think it's in the neighborhood of at least 15 to $18 a month minimum. Um, we did get notified that the city is changing one of their plans. I, it's either life insurance or I think it's some kind of life insurance that will actually save us a little money and they thankfully did contact us and Michelle is working um, with the um, insurance provider and I believe the contact at the city to, to move over our retirees on that. But I'm told there's not much we can do about that, but you know, for our, our total budget, where I think if you looked, I'm not sure that it's on here because the whole year to date budget, but I think we've only budgeted like a $10,000 surplus, you know, exclusive of any, 
like extraneous money, like the PPP money, our budget was pretty close to break even. And when if we didn't budget this money for the retiree expense, um, it's gonna obviously affect our bottom line. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and I think that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Well, he just made a case for having centralized um, office, what, having all of you guys in one place. <laughs> so mail doesn't go to a different one. Well, and not moving around every other year too, I guess, which is hard to hard to accommodate, but we, we're doing, um, we've set up a designated um, invoices, uh, shared mailbox. So, we have made that available to any vendor that um, tries to email us or send us anything electronically. So if there's turnover, it doesn't sit in my mailbox or um, Connie's mailbox or somebody who's no longer with us, it is there and then you just give different people access to it. So that's, a, and, and we've also tried to do, um, the, make sure that we've updated our mailing address with the uh, whoever, we, whenever we get mail that's not to us, that somehow makes it to us, we let them know. Any questions? Uh, I've got one question. Um, it was in your like executive summary. Um, whoops, somehow I just got rid of it. There you go. Um, under number one, like see how you explain that we're slightly under budget with the year-to-date operating net income of 149 versus the budget of 275. Is there like that? So that difference is like, if you take out these kind of short-term. Exactly. Um, Kathleen, if you could go to page five of the whole thing. It's a, yep, right there. Yeah, so if you if you just take out that six hundred forty four thousand dollars, that's what you're left with. So we are, well, we are in um currently in a surplus net income situation. We're lagging behind the budget. Um, the expense areas for the most part are in check, but again, it's on the it's the revenue side. Mm -hmm. And is mostly is that mostly like our that our rent revenue is not as anticipated? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you foresee any um, outside help coming with regard to the rent? Um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. I might have to defer to someone else on that. I mean, I know that there are efforts being made to like, just to be clear too, the revenue is as if everyone paid us 100%. Um, at the end of the year, we will look at like bad debt to say how likely it is to be collected. And in the future, we may do some kind of factor to adjust that month to month. But um, the revenue hasn't been adjusted down for collections. So um, that's another thing to factor into that, that you know, it's likely it, um, whatever adjustment will um, go down. But I do know that um, there are efforts being made when we have seen um, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, I want to say between three and four thousand dollars from the rent relief program, the state program, where um, a few applications had been done. Uh, for our tenants with us as the landlord. And we have had some success with that. And I know that they're working to um, get additional applications in before the deadline on 1130. Okay. But um, where we sit year to date, those other funds are, the, you know, we that, that has kind of made us flush. But, you know, this is the conversation that I have with John constantly is that, you know, when we look to make changes over, you know, if it's salary increases or something's gonna affect the budget is gonna increase, we have to know, well, how are we doing on the revenue and expense side exclusive of the extraordinary revenues 
um, are we keeping track? And if we're not, and we think that things are gonna increase next year or change, um, maybe department by department, because um, you know the COC revenue may go down because of the way the units are gonna be situated with the redevelopment. So how, how do we make that up? And I think that's, those are all discussions that need to be had when, when we start talking about the budget for next year. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Executive director update. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll pick up where Mary Lou left off a little bit, just touching on the budget a little bit more. Um, Crescent Halls through a curveball, the, the changing of Crescent Halls, the redevelopment plan, uh, drastically changed revenues for the housing authority. Um, the plan included keeping, re keeping Crescent Halls at least partially filled um, with adding voucher units, which provided an a, additional rental revenue for the housing authority because the vouchers would have been project-based and the funding would have came to the landlord. So we would have issued the vouchers to then lease them up in our units, uh, which the voucher returns a higher dollar amount monthly than uh, traditional public housing units. Um, so that has drastically changed um, the funding for the housing authority. Um, it did not hurt the housing authority because we had other sources. Um, last year, we were awarded shortfall funding. Um, it was roughly $700,000. Um, we used part of that last year, and then we finished the remainder this year. Uh, Mary Lou just showed it was $515,000 this year. Um, so that helped a lot, and it made it possible to change the redevelopment plan at Crescent Halls without um, us having to go find additional sources to cover uh, the reduction in tenant revenue. Um, and then I'll touch on... Um, Shelby's rent cafe training request for residents. Uh, we're currently working on getting the staff trained for rent cafe. It's new, they're still rolling out the modules. Um, so staff is getting trained on it and then we will also have the training for the residents. And then the maintenance concerns, we do have a meeting with um, FAR to talk about maintenance uh, issues. Um, if they receive calls from tenants, we discuss that during that time. Um, it, a lot of the times the maintenance concerns aren't already in work orders. So we add the work order and then track it from there. Uh, we provide updates to follow on those work orders. And then for my uh, typical update, uh, we're currently working through the corrective action plan, uh, which is the caps that HUD created with the housing authority in, in the city to address the public housing deficiencies and the HCV deficiencies. Um, we also do have a financial improvement plan, which we uh, signed at the end of last year, which allowed us to access the shortfall funding. Um, so we did get approved for uh, FY 2022 shortfall funding as well. And that is an amount of uh, approximately $500,000. And so um, we can't touch that money yet until we have a approved plan by HUD, um, but we should not have an issue getting that plan approved. Um, the goal to access this second portion of the funds is to meet a month of operating reserve, just having one month. Um, based upon the budget that was sent over to HUD today, we had over five months of reserve in our uh, bank account to cover uh, operations for public housing for up to five months. Um, so that should not be an issue to access. We did plan to use that for the next budget year. Um, so nine times out of 10, the funds won't be seen this year. Uh, they would start being um, drawn down in April of next year. We are preparing for a HUD REACT inspection. Uh, it's anticipated to happen between January and March of 2022. Um, we are looking at um, hiring a firm to come and inspect all the public housing units uh, to create work orders. Um, and We've discussed addressing those work orders in multiple different ways to include our staff addressing them and also hiring temp work um, to also address them. Last year, we got down to the same issue and it also happened around Crescent Halls where we have um, 
10 to 13 staff members in maintenance, and we have six of them working in the vacant units, turning them over to be leased up by um, currently some Crescent Halls families relocating, and then individuals that are on our wait list. Uh, we stopped doing turns last year in the beginning of this year to focus on um, the audit in Crescent Halls and our numbers uh, took a deep dive. Uh, we moved out a lot of families and um, we weren't turning any units because we spent about a month and a half working through Crescent Halls to get those units ready for families to transition from floor to floor when we were doing the original floor by floor uh, redevelopment approach. Um, so we're trying not to do that again this year uh, by bringing in another firm to assist us with working on the work orders. Uh, vacancy update. We currently have a total of 20 vacant units. Um, five of those units are at South First Street. So those units are going to be uh, under demo dispo as of this week or early next week. Uh, we did get the approval from HUD to move forward with submitting the demo dispo application for redevelopment of South First Street phase two. Um, so that would only leave 15 of those units that are not, uh, that need to be turned. Um, we have four of them ready or currently in the progress of getting completed based on uh, cleaning the floors or cleaning the unit. So buffing and waxing the floors or cleaning the unit. Um, two of them are already planned to be leased up by uh, Crescent Halls tenants and uh, based upon that, we're on track to meet our goal of having zero vacancies uh, by April 1st. We're currently at 93% occupancy. That was based, that was as of Wednesday of last week. Since then, we've leased up four units. So I have not ran the correct report to remove some of the uh, units that are under demo dispo. When a unit sits vacant longer than two months, HUD allowed two weeks. HUD allows you to take that unit and take it offline if it requires significant work uh, to get that unit back online. And we've done that with multiple units. Um, so we still receive operating subsidy for those units. We don't re receive a rent subsidy. Um, so the units that are offline, uh, they don't count against us on a vacancy, only the units that are online. And one of the ones that have been vacant for the longest, I think it's 1800 days right now, um, is slated to be completed uh, Wednesday. So that's the longest vacancy we do have. Under the management cap, CRHA is working with the RAB and Legal Aid to rewrite the ACUP, uh, which is the Emissions and Continued Occupancy Policy for Public Housing. We anticipate having this policy completed into the board uh, in January. Also under management, an item that was flagged by HUD is the tenant accounts receivable. Um, I'm not a thousand percent sure on this number based upon a report I just received. Uh, but as of last week, our tenant accounts receivable was at $92,000. That is the amount of rent that's owed from tenants to the housing authority. Um, this is also the most worrying indicator that we have. Um, we have to get our TARS down. It's one of the issues that have been flagged by HUD. Um, they ask us about it every other week. Um, we are currently working through the rent relief program to get funding and uh, asking other sources as well uh, to assist families that are delinquent. Um, Crescent Hall's update. We currently have under 18 families in the building and only three of them are actively searching for a home. Uh, everyone else has have found a location um, and have a, a move-in date or they're just waiting on a move-in date uh, to move into their new homes. So we are on schedule to get the building emptied by the end of the year. Um, the contractor has noted if we do uh, turn the building over to them sooner, we will be able to reoccupy uh, the entire building sooner and may be on schedule uh, based upon the original contract. Uh, 
Um, one of the items that did not come up tonight, um, we've received a lot of complaints about our trash on site, especially at West Haven and at South First Street behind the 904 and 902 building. Um, so we're working with the trash company to address the issues. Um, the contract identifies the trash company cleaning around the trash bays after dumping the dumpster. Uh, that has not been happening. So we are in talks with them about that. We're also working with residents to create a resident stipend program where the residents are also a part of taking care of the site while also hiring at least one more maintenance employee uh, to also help assist with that. And, and that will be at all the sites, but one of the bigger issues we've had lately um, has been at West Haven. Uh, not all of the issue is CRHA. Um, the Peloton has two dumpsters that block Run Street. Um, I've tried numerous times to get in contact with the owner. Um, he doesn't come in until one o'clock. The business doesn't open till four o'clock. They don't answer calls between one and four. Um, Red Hub has also been an issue. Um, they park a vehicle right in front of our dumpster, which has blocked the trash company from removing uh, the dumpster and dumping it a couple of times. I've taken pictures. I've been in contact with um, them as well. And we have now placed a concrete barrier in front of that parking space to block um, anyone from blocking the dumpster. Um, so we are working to address that issue. I know it didn't come up, but I know a lot of residents listened to the meeting afterwards. So I wanted to make that announcement. Um, the HCV department, I'll give an update there. They're 100% complete in HUS inspections and 100% on recertifications. Those were uh, annual recertifications. Those were two big items that were uh, dinged on the uh, audits from HUD. Um, so the department is 100% complete on both of those. Um, they currently have 447 vouchers leased, uh, which is approximately an 80 voucher increase from this time last year. And that is all I have, unless you all have some questions for me. I had one question. Did you say that HUD assists families that are delinquent uh, no, um, they, we're looking to find assistance for families that are delinquent, uh, through the rental relief program from the state and other means, but okay. no, HUD, HUD has been on us, uh, to get the accounts down because, um, they went from $0 in June and July to, uh, 90, over $90,000 in a few months. So they're really worried about that indicator. And then my other question is, have y'all considered towing the private um, in businesses that park blocking the trash? That yes. usually helps. Yes, and so our towing contractor is, I don't think he's able to satisfy our needs. Um, every time I call, they're short drivers and it takes multiple hours to get to us. Uh, plus we have a agreement with them where they cannot tow until after nine. So I'm looking to change that because now they're really restricted. I mean, most of the complaints I hear about West Haven are UVA students parking and taking up their parking spots. And with our current contractor and our contract with them, it says that, I mean, they can't even respond to that um, until after 9 p.m. So it's something that we need to change on our end. They said it, they received uh, some type of documents from us a couple of years ago or three years ago saying that we didn't want them towing until after 9 p.m. Um, so we're working to change that and we may also need to get a new firm that can uh, deal with our needs. Y'all used to have one that would tow at the drop of a dime. Yeah, I don't think the current one is able to do that, unfortunately. I'm pretty sure we can find somebody to be happy to tow for us. <laughs> Cause they make big money. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Sales. We can now hear from um, redevelopment. Mr. Kyle, who's doing redevelopment? That's me. Okay. There we go been having some issues with Zoom this week. 
Um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, I'm Brandon Collins. I'm your redevelopment coordinator for CRHA. Um, and just gonna give a quick update. Um, I'm hoping uh, you all saw the newsletter update that went out earlier today. Um, that's actually the second one we've done. Um, my hope is to get that out twice a month, um, somewhere around board meetings, somewhere around redevelopment committee meetings. Um, but I've uh, been busy uh, working through uh, the action plan that John and Kathleen had for me. Um, one thing I'm pretty excited about uh, moving forward is the engaging English learners plan. Um, so, uh, we have a plan still putting in, uh, you know, some process and infrastructure, but, uh, for the most part, ready to launch, um, uh, communication with, uh, some of our public housing residents. There's been some hiccups on some of the languages, particularly Farsi, um, that's still working through, but, uh, very excited to be able to start using that, um, and, and making that a reality so we can better engage residents. Um, so uh, just real quick, Crescent Halls, uh, John reported um, uh, clearing out the building is going really well um, and uh, in pretty short order. So that is uh, really amazing. Um, and as a result, it does sound like we can get um, construction and completion of the building a little closer to the original schedule. Um, they'll be working with GMA to finalize a revised schedule and scope of work. Um, and hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have that schedule in place and, and hoping to, to hit November of next year um, for completion. Um, the x-rays of the pipes uh, happened on the above the first floor. Um, as you know, we're replacing all the pipes in the building uh, with the exception of some pipes um, above the first floor um, that uh, appear to be extremely sturdy and better quality than what we would replace them with. Um, so they've, they've gone through and x-rayed those and we're waiting on the results for that. Um, but that, uh, that plan has moved forward. Um, so first phase two, um, as you may be aware, uh, our hangups getting a site plan amendment um, were finally uh, gotten passed. Uh, so they are now able to prepare the land where building three is supposed to go and that uh, work is proceeding. Um, that helps things move forward a little better, still a little bit behind schedule, but um, they can begin that work. Um, buildings one and two are really starting to turn into to buildings. Uh, if you drive by there, you'll see some brick going up. Um, the windows are in, the roofs are mainly completed, um, and uh, that's super exciting. Um, phase two, as John mentioned, the demo dispo application uh, and mixed finance application have gone in. Um, it, it took a lot of doing to figure out the mixed finance application. Um, but what we've landed on uh, is uh, phase two, we'll have 20 public housing units, 38 project-based vouchers, and 55 non-subsidized units. Um, we are uh, evaluating how low we can get those rents down for those non-subsidized units, but uh, it appears that uh, we can get those down pretty low. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, we have pre-construction services lined up for South First Street Phase 2, uh, as well as 6th Street. Um, and that will help uh, get pricing on track for Phase 2 of South First Street. Uh, and just general constructability and maybe find some ways to um, save some money through value engineering. Uh, there will be, we have scheduled a resident uh, relocation meeting for South First Street Phase 2. Um, and uh, the plan is to have uh, two meetings on December 15th. Um, that will be the first step in uh, developing a relocation plan that uh, I believe this board will approve. Um, but we need to have that in hand and submit it to HUD. 
uh, but we got to have those resident meetings to make sure they're we're doing everything we can to uh, to include residents and make sure they're taken care of. Um, Sixth Street uh, is moving forward. Uh, there's a site plan submitted to the city for approval um, for a first phase, uh, what we call Building A. Um, Building A uh, is going to be there, kind of along Monticello and sort of wrapping around the the corner onto Sixth Street. Um, will be four stories uh, with 50 homes. Uh, we'll have an elevator um, and parking uh, underneath. Uh, we'll have uh, 19 one bedrooms, six two bedrooms, and 25 three bedroom apartments. Um, there's a lot of community space on the ground floor um, for kids and grown-ups and uh, and all that. And uh, just recently, we discussed and, and sort of did more details for what the outside of that building is going to have a really amazingly cool um, outside community space um, with some terraces and big play areas and um, basketball court. Um, along with that, a master plan for the full site uh, is, is being developed. Um, I think if you see the newsletter, you can sort of see a picture of where things are headed with it. Um, you know, nothing set in stone, um, but we're envisioning on the farther side of the site, uh, a second apartment building. It will be a little smaller than building A, and we're calling that building B. Uh, and in between, we'll have uh, somewhere on 20 to 25 townhomes, uh, of which right now we're looking at um, six of those being set aside as home ownership um, townhomes. Uh, and residents uh, have been participating fairly well in that process as well. Uh, excited to say uh, we do have a timeline for West Haven and uh, the idea is we'll be shooting for a LIHTC application for a first phase of West Haven uh, in March 2024. Um, the idea is we can get started um, with engagement, uh, pick up some speed on engagement in the spring, um, select an architect and go full on resident planning to develop a master plan and a site plan for a first phase of West Haven. And super also excited uh, about the parallel track moving forward. Um, this board has talked about the parallel track for a long time. What is the parallel track? Uh, that is for uh, scattered sites, uh, mainly uh, those sites that aren't going to uh, see a full on tear down and rebuild anytime soon, um, but which uh, also deserve a lot of attention. Um, with renovations and so the idea is we're, we're going to find out priorities for residents and move forward um, through a through a process of similar uh, resident-led process uh, for our scattered sites uh, and we've started with engagement on that and that's going to pick up steam and some of that's going to correspond with um, the capital fund um, that we will uh, we'll also be working with residents on, kind of wrap those things together. <clears throat> Looking forward, um, some things to think about. Uh, we, we are gonna need to dig in uh, a little bit or a lot bit uh, on our financing and our use of subsidies at Sixth Street. Uh, it's an opportunity to um, catch up uh, on our fair cloth or at least not get any deeper in the hole on our um, fair cloth count, which is your public housing count. Um, for those who don't know, there was a law passed. You can't have any more public housing than you already had since October 1st, 1999. Um, we've, we've, we've kind of got some uh, in a bucket just waiting around. Um, we don't want to go deeper into that bucket. Uh, and, and we do have a lot to think about about how we empty that bucket at some point. Um, we'll be coming back to you with more information about West Haven and a kickoff um, around the spring. Um, South First Street Phase Two relocation plan 
Um, we will begin planning for use of the capital fund pretty soon, pretty much once you're done with the annual plan, hopefully we'll have a capital plan uh, in your hands. Um, we've, we've mostly determined what we're doing about utilities. Uh, we've got a long ways to go on figuring out some transit things. And uh, of course, uh, programming and partners. Um, and so I'm excited to say we're also uh, doing engagement starting right now with South First Street and Sixth Street on our, um, you know, what programming, what partners, what services are important to residents on, on the various sites. And that will uh, better help the resident services committee and, and everyone be able to get the right programs and the right partners involved. So. That is my update. I have a question. Um, when you convert the units over to LIHTC and they go to vouchers, those numbers do, can those be counted as public housing residents? In other words, increasing the number of public housing units that you can have to replace those? There's a, a it, that's a hard question to answer. Um, it really depends on, kind of depends on the site and what we're replacing. Um, HUD doesn't want any additional subsidy, whether it's public housing or voucher, section eight housing. Um, so at Sixth Street, for example, there's 25 public housing units. They're not gonna want to see more than 25 subsidized from HUD units, no matter what pile of money it's coming from, from them. Um, and that is disappointing. The opportunity there is that uh, we can expand the amount of housing overall on the site um, so that we won't have to rely, uh, we can make decisions about public housing to preserve more public housing because we're kind of creating our own subsidy um, by having enough units there to, to finance the operations of that site, if that makes sense. And I'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, so HUD will allow us to add more subsidized units to the site if we're removing them from our housing choice voucher portfolio. So HUD says, hey, you have this many vouchers you can lease up. Um, I think our count now is 553, I believe. I may be off on that by a little bit because it is changing based upon um, the addition of uh, tenant protection vouchers at Crescent Halls, plus additional vouchers we're receiving um, from mainstream uh, emergency housing vouchers. Uh, so these special vouchers, so it's increasing. Um, so we can use those vouchers to cover additional subsidy on the non-subsidized units, but they aren't going to provide the additional subsidy. So what your current site has, so at South, I mean, at Sixth Street is 25. That's all they will fund, but you can fund additional ones by reducing your tenant-based vouchers. So you can project-base some of those vouchers on the site anyway. And nine times out of 10, those vouchers will end up back in a CRHA property anyway, due to the, um, the market supply of landlord-owned units. Um, the rent for those units are constantly going up. And so later on, we're gonna, it won't be at this meeting, but in a couple of meetings from now, uh, we're gonna put in front of you the, um, the housing assistance payments and the payment standard for HCV. And so those HUD actually reduced um, the rents on those this year. So while the actual market is increasing, sometimes a hundred to two hundred dollars per unit size, HUD is actually reducing the eligible um, the number of units that are eligible by reducing the payment standard for those units. So the more units we build, even if they're not subsidized, nine times out of ten they will be subsidized just because there's no other units to attach that voucher to. We have vouchers that turn over all the time because individuals are having a hard time finding units. And sometimes it's not just that the unit's not there, it's because they have barriers in place uh, that we are more flexible with. 
So we're more flexible when it comes to some of the background checks and um, in credit scores. I mean, there are some apartment complexes that won't touch a tenant if their credit score is in 650 or higher. So they've added these additional barriers in place to make it harder for individuals to lease units mm -hmm. with vouchers while we've removed those barrier, barriers and we're also building the unit. So nine times out of 10, more of our units will be subsidized, but they will not be subsidized with a contract uh, that's guaranteed over a certain term of years. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, mm -hmm. Public comments. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Um, did we get a link to go into closed section? Yes. Did somebody send it to me. I don't have it. You should have your email now. And I just oh, say it there now. Okay, I'll go to it there after I leave this. Um, I move that the board enter closed session pursuant to Virginia Code section two two three seven eleven a one for purposes of discussing the performance and contract of the executive director. Can I get a second beyond Socrates? I second. <laughs> we second the movement. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll see you guys in a few. Oh, do we have to call roll on that? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think we should. Uh, mm -hmm. Chair Henry? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Mayor Walker? Yes. Commissioner Wicks? Yes. Commissioner Parker? Yes. Okay, we'll see you in a few.